future president, James Garfield. Tyler was a brigadier general in May of 1862, and uh, he became a brigade commander in the Army of the Potomac Fifth Corps. Eventually, brevet as major general in March of 1865, and appointed postmaster of Baltimore by President Christopher B. Hayes. Look at those boys in, in blue. Tyler was always active in the Masonic fraternity. Uh, he also was very active in the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. He died in January of 1891 at the age of 69. The Many of the soldiers who fought in the 7th Ohio came from Oberlin College in Ohio. They were mustered in, they were recruited in the northeast part of the state and re uh, mustered in in Cleveland, Ohio. At this particular battle, they were about 850 strong. Well, this one's in red at the, the Confederates had close to 2,000. Red at the, end. the 7th Ohio had no artillery support, no cavalry support, but the Confederates of John Floyd had three artillery pieces, which you see out there in front of you, and they also had a contingent of cavalry support. French elite troops. The 7th Ohio was surprised by this morning, morning attack, early morning attack. These men had been camped in the mountains. They have been permitted no fires at night. Uh, did not want to give away their position to any Confederates that were lurking in the area. And uh, they were hungry and they were cold. Even though it was August in the high mountains of West Virginia, it gets very cold at night. And these men were just breaking out their breakfast eating maybe a little hardtack, whatever they had in their haversack, starting to eat, maybe to boil a little bit of coffee, when the Confederates attack and catch them by surprise. So sometimes this battle is referred to as the Battle of the Forks and Spoons. The Forks and the Spoons, as well as the Battle of Cross Lanes, are the Battle of Cross Lanes. We see the Confederate artillery opening up. We see the long roll. The long roll has been sounded. The long roll is when that drum just And that is the signal to all the men to get out of your tents, grab your combat gear, your fighting gear, and uh, fall into line that we are under attack. There were three major companies in this unit, the 7th Ohio, that are gonna bear the brunt of the fight here. You might keep in mind that each company, at least on paper, had a hundred men uh, and four officers. And that's on paper and it doesn't account for the soldiers who are ill, who are sick, who are, have been assigned to other duties and deep. And now, coming out on the flank of the, con or on the Union, our North Confederate artillerymen, <laughs> catching these Union soldiers by surprise. Their breakfast had to be devoured quickly into the formations and hopefully prepare to repulse the Confederates. They are outnumbered at least two to one. The Ohio boys about 850, Floyd's uh, Confederates about 2,000 plus or minus. Remember this is very early war. War has only been declared. The firing at Fort Sumter the 12th of April, 1861. Tremendous disorganization, really on both sides, on both sides of this fight, uh, which I suspect you will see today. I'm gonna pass this mic over to my compatriot, John Gibney, and let him talk a little bit about uniforms, equipment, weapons that are gonna be used in this battle. We're looking at a collection of different uniforms here, and uh, on our right, if you look there, uh, that would be their left flank. We have Zouab uniforms. These are from Algeria. They were also passed over into the French Army. Uh, the most famous is the 5th New York Zouab. The uniform that they have there is very, very similar. Um, the Zouabs were a craze that passed through the United States. This craze was uh, sometimes called the cult of the Zouab. Because uh, Elmer Zou uh, Elmer. Ellsworth, who was a good friend of Abraham Lincoln, was one of the first people to be killed in the war. And because of that, there are over 5,000 different companies or regiments that had some form of Zouab dress. Uh, one of the most famous collection of photographs we have is the 4th Michigan, 
Flint, Michigan are uh, very familiar with dark blue pants and zoo out caps on top. This is also um, given to a number of other Michigan regiments, including the 16th Michigan, and there's some evidence that it was also in the 15th Michigan. So regimental uh, recognition of the fact that Elmer Ellsworth was an important part of the first part of the war, you can see that reflected in the uniforms. Next to them we have uniforms with hammer locks on the back. It was considered that you wanted to make sure that Did you, you get didn't get sunburn. Today we actually have uh, a lot of people that are concerned about sunburn and they are now giving those out again. Uh, I, I know a number of companies are making those. At the time of the Civil War they were very, very unpopular and a lot of the guys took them off and tore up the muslin that was in there and used it to wipe it. Probably some of that guy they don't get that. Yeah. That is a more Calm familiar down. uniform. You can see some of the men had slouch hats. Uh, a few of the men are wearing No, I meant what was in your jeep, like what were you chewing on? Yeah, nothing. Early in the morning, a lot of cut pieces they'd be wearing, but also as your cut piece gets, falls apart, you probably would start putting uh, some of the slouch hats on your head. There's uh, some evidence that a lot of these units from the north were actually wearing gray uniforms. And the same thing is true from the South. There are a lot of uniforms that were entirely different. So you might not know who the enemy is as they come walking out of the woods. This regiment we're looking at, in the middle of the regiment, you see both of the flags that are out there. You have a national flag and probably a flag from the state of Ohio. Um, also in Michigan, you'd have flags the same way. You'd have a national flag. You'd also have a state flag to go with it. You're looking at the officers carrying the men and talking to them before the battle, making sure that they're ready to face the enemy. This is probably the first time that they've ever had to do that. They're now marching out onto the field in fours. With a cavalry escort in front. Look at all those farmers. I think they're a little outnumbered, yeah. It's because the good guys always win. Quite a few people probably have old swim lines. That could be on the Confederate side. The Confederates are now appearing off to our west edge coming out of the woods. You can see the body blue flags they're carrying. You hear the bugle. Companies are stopping, facing front. Oh, dang. <laughs> you can see that all of the soldiers are firing at once the Confederates. You can get as many mini balls in the air as possible. Mini balls are a rifle. Projectile that was vetted earlier before the Civil War, and the tactics that were used before this were tactics used by a musket that could only shoot about 30 or 40 yards. This volley you can go out to shoot. I'm a the horses. There was a great volley fired by the 8th Ohio. It just was a little high since we didn't have a single casualty out there. So, this is mountainous terrain, and I think that mountainous terrain probably accounts for that. John mentioned the Havelocks, those white hat covers. You would see them early in the war, but you never see them after, probably not much after the Peninsula Camp in 1862. As John said, they were not very popular, and uh, soldiers took those things off to solve them in a variety of ways. And also, um, there were a number of units decided to have straw hats, and they found out they made very good targets. You need to shoot faster than that.
Oh, we got a casualty. We have a casualty out there. Oh. Several casualties. A couple Johnny's on hitting the dust. Unbroken. Two flags lying there. <laughs> One wounded Confederate crawling, trying to get to the rear, looking for some assistance. And that old Bonnie blue flag. Our flag bearers uh, are some of the strongest and best men. Quite often, the men were six feet tall. Usually, sergeants carry the flag. Oh, dang. <laughs> Quite often you were fighting with your brothers, with your cousins. Did he get shot by his own guy? I think he got shot by his own guy. Is that what they did? And uh, you can see that star again. And one of the most popular songs early in the war for the South was uh, for the Bonnie Blue Play. Uh oh. Hurrah, hurrah for Southern rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the Bonnie Blue Flag that pours a single star. We would like to request that the Boy Scouts. Yeah, they're not listening to you. Oh! You the famous rebel yell out there? You can see the position of both federal and confederate cavalry here. They protect the flanks of the infantry oh, oh, oh. They're also used for reconnaissance. They use a lot of, uh, they have scouting missions. But their purpose in this little action is to protect the left flank of the Union Army and the right flank of the Confederates. We also see some nurses moving out on the field now to deal with the wounded. And I'm reminded that uh, when this engagement is over, there will be medical scenarios down here at the base of the hill, uh, where you can see the uh, reenactors who are uh, doctors who do the uh, ambulance for the soldiers who try to repair uh, the wounds, take care of the wounds. Um, we have a little cavalry action over here. They're firing pistols. You see that haze of black powder smoke hanging over the battlefield. The wind is wafting it away, but you might also think if we had 50,000 or 100,000 men out there firing. How that cloud would hang over the battlefield, over the soldiers, over the combatants. And that's when those great battle flags became so important. The color bearers would wave those high so that the men could see them, identify their lines, and try to rally around the flag. Rally, rally, rally around the flag, boys. Rally once again. More casualties. We see some nurses working up there. I think the one guy Of interest. A 
on August 26th of 1861, the King of Hawaii, King of the Hawaiian Islands, declared for his island country neutrality in the Civil War. How's that for a side back? Uh oh, they're pushing us back. You'll notice know soldiers on both sides here. They're maneuvering around. But there is confusion. These are new troops. These are southerners and northern soldiers that have never really seen the elephant or, in other words, seen a battle yet. This is something new to men on both sides. So there is some confusion, and that confusion was really manifest more on the northern side in this fight than it was on the southern side. We see Confederates they move. They continue to move toward the northwest. Oh. The Union troops intend to rally in a cemetery hill just near the intersection of um, the Kessler's Cross, uh, Kessler's Cross Lane and the Gauley River Road. That cemetery was called the Zohar Cemetery. We saw a company A, C, and K of Pico, Ohio pull back and try to defend at that point. But we also realized that a lot of Union troops began to flee from the battle. They would run back to the site of uh, Goblin Crossing. That oh, the red guy's still here. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, That's dedication right there. And carrying his buddy back, a wounded Zawab, getting back to the line. That's impressive. A Confederate prison camp. Research this unit, we found that 
for this battle. They also had, another source said 83 men were casual. Another source, 132 men. Another Thank you. 
Look at the beauty. Look at the beauty of the stars and stripes out there. Wind blows in, flag is unfurled. What a beautiful national flag we have. Red, the white, and the blue. The red represents the blood that we have sacrificed from the beginning of this country to our current conflicts. And the white, the purity of our cause, our constitution, our belief in life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And the blue represents fraternity, that we all belong to this fraternity called the United States of America. A beautiful flag. <laughs> oh, seriously? Born and raised in Kessler's Cross Lane. He fought in this battle against the 7th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Two weeks later, at the Battle of Carnifax Ferry, he was captured and he became a POW sent to Camp Chase, Ohio, from which he escaped and he returned to West Virginia, where he was assigned to some scouting duty. But again, Captain Halstead was captured and held until the end of the war when he was paroled. When the war ended, he returned to Kessler's Crossroads where he would live out his life. He was elected sheriff of the county, and he became the oldest Confederate veteran in Nicholas County in West Virginia. He died in April of 1931, and he was buried in the community where he lived, he fought, and he served in a political position as sheriff, and he always claimed he was very proud of his Confederate service. Our engagement here has come to an end as the victorious Confederates rally and pull off the field. Uh, they would be moving back to the south. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you please not to leave. We still have a little bit of the program still to go. This is the most beautiful part that we as reenactors get to do. Rise up! Isn't resurrection an amazing and beautiful thing? In our battles, Fakers. we don't have, we do not have injuries. We do not shed real blood. But keep in mind that in the conflict from 1861 to 1865, 700,000 Americans, men and women, were killed in that conflict. If you figure out the day, what that would be in a civil war, we would be talking 12 million, 13 million people giving their lives in this type of a, an engagement. Don't leave yet because you're going to enjoy the ceremonies. And remember, we always have uh, the Trinity Task War Society that hosts this monster for you, Ms. Kim Conan. Kim Wade. Ladies and gentlemen, these two gentlemen that are in the golf cart that are coming out have been with you for 32 years. They are part of the original team to bring you this monster here from Mason to Jackson. They are most well respected at the national level. These two guys speak in the artillery world and the Civil War hobby and the Civil War hobby. At this time, Kim is presenting them with plaques, honoring them. Ladies and gentlemen, 
please. Give these two gentlemen a round of applause of your appreciation for 30 years standing on this field for you. <laughs> Gentlemen, stand fast. Jim, John, this is for you. This is just a safety precaution that we do as reenactors to ensure that the weapons are cleared for your safety. And the patient will die. It is a test. Front center. Cut him down. Put him down. Put him down now. Where are you going? The anesthetist is anesthetized. And now the anesthetist will give the ether and chloroform in combination. All right, guys. Give me the knife. Skin knife. We're now using superficial skin knife. Uh oh, she's got red in her hair. <laughs> oh, he got her. <laughs> now we shall now go with the tissue knife down to the bone. The tourniquet is in place. Are you able, folks, able to see this? He's <laughs> like, you know, you know, in, in medicine, there's, there's, a, there's a saying <laughs> see one, do one, teach one. <laughs> Y'all believe that? Oh, all right, what, you, may, you may be called upon to do this. All right. All right, all right. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> 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 Oh, 
Hopefully she doesn't pass out. <laughs> All right. Now the saw. 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 Give me the saw. Oh, I'm saw. Saw. Also exsanguinate and die. Good girl. Give me that food. Give me a long time. <laughs> Bad hand, huh? Mother's here. <laughs> 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 Mom, I want to hear you. I didn't read the Everybody's got the same blood type. Light him up now. I'm gonna let him up. Mother's here. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job. Thank you. Only till he wakes up. Gotta let him wake up. Let him know mother's here. Ladies and gentlemen, you have this one of the high points. <laughs> <laughs>